I'm here with Harvard Business School professor Jan Rifkin to discuss competitiveness. Thank you so much for having us, Thank Professor you, Rifkin. Uh, I want to start with where we are right now as an economy in the U.S. There's a lot of confusion about how healthy our economy is, uh, how competitive we are relative to the rest of the world. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton certainly have sure. different outlooks. Uh, how is the state of the economy right now? Yeah. So it's decidedly mixed, mm -hmm. right? There are some great things about the American economy and there's some distinctive weaknesses. Yeah. But there is an economic outcome that I think many of us find very disturbing, the lack of shared prosperity in the country. Mm -hmm. That large companies and the people who run them and invest in them in America are doing quite well. But working and middle-class Americans and many small businesses are struggling. When we think about that reality, how, how did we get here. It seems that for many, the recession of 2009 is fresh in our minds. Is that the cause or do we have some longer systemic issues? Yeah, no, there's a lot of focus on the great recession and the not so great recovery. But when we look at the disturbing economic outcomes in America, in fact, many of them, really all the important ones, started before the great recession. So we're looking at long-term structural changes here. Hmm. And when we think about those long-term structural changes, though, are those um, changes that have kind of been cast aside or not recognized as much because of the recession? What are some of those issues that really come to front of mind when thinking about competitiveness? Sure. You know, for figuring that out, one of the most important things we've done is we've gone out to our alumni and surveyed them on the state of U.S. competitiveness. Yes. And in doing that, one of the questions we've asked is about the strengths and weaknesses of the country. So we've confronted the alumni with 19 elements of the business environment that prior research has shown to be drivers of national competitiveness over the long run. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the patterns there, they're distinctive. The good news is America has some enormous strengths, a great context for entrepreneurship, for innovation, high quality firm management, vibrant capital markets. The problem is those strengths are weighed down by some historical strengths that are getting worse, like our workforce skills, and some weaknesses that are getting even worse. A uh, paralyzed political system, a convoluted tax code, a weak K through 12 education system, weak health care system. And when we think about shared prosperity or the lack thereof, yeah. it seems that in the political arena, it's discussed as uh, increased inequality. Is that yeah. the wrong term to use? So, you know, we, we talk much more about shared prosperity and a lack of shared prosperity. I think it's actually a more productive way to think about it, mm. right? And, and here's why. Um, reducing inequality and creating shared prosperity are related, but they're not the same. Mm -hmm. Shared prosperity is about improving the absolute outcomes of all Americans. Inequality is an inherently relative measure. So just as an example, I can reduce inequality without creating shared prosperity. I could take money from the rich and burn it. Mm -hmm. That would reduce inequality. Yes. It would not produce shared prosperity. Right. And we've had this illusion, though, to some degree, of shared prosperity or increased shared prosperity helped by credit or increased yeah. credit, at least during the recession. Did that complicate factors? Yeah, so I think that we managed to mask some underlying structural problems for a long time by making some promises to ourselves mm -hmm. as a society. So, you know, probably starting around the 1980s, we already had effects of globalization, technological change, putting intense pressure on America's middle class. We could have responded to that by doubling down to try to make our middle class enormously productive and able to compete with anyone around the world. Mm. But instead, honestly, what we did is we made a series of unsustainable promises. Promises like, don't worry about your stagnant household incomes, middle class. We're going to extend you credit. Please go out and buy, mm. particularly buy houses. Promises like, we will increasingly cover your health care costs and retirement. Promises like, uh, we will um, uh, you know, do all of this while reducing taxes in all tax brackets. Mm -hmm. You take those promises, you couple them with a bad downturn and a couple of wars, and you've got deep fiscal problems for the federal government. And it seems that there's been a backlash against some of the or the, the causes behind lower wages or seeming causes, like uh, automation and outsourcing and globalization, yeah. and those are now being attacked. Is that 
dangerous? Because can we really stop globalization and automation? Yeah, yeah, no, when you look at the lack of shared prosperity, there, there are basically three categories of drivers, mm -hmm. right? There is globalization technological change, right. just as you mentioned. There is a set of, um, of institutional changes, the weakening of labor unions, their changes in the tax code uh, that favor certain types of uh, workers over others. And then finally, there's a systematic underinvestment in some of the shared resources we need to be productive. Mm -hmm. Workforce skills, education, infrastructure. Now those three have very different potential responses. On technological change and globalization, you can try to hold back that tide, but I wish you luck. Mm -hmm. I think that's basically trying to you know, prevent the future, right. right? On the institutional changes, you could try to change those and reverse them. And I think we uh, need a serious national debate about whether we'll try to redistribute income, for instance. Uh, but those are going to be very long-term debates and they're going to be fraught with politics. On this third category, though, the systematic underinvestment in the shared resources we need to keep workers productive, there, there are opportunities for just win-wins, mm. right? And we should be for sure taking advantage of the opportunities we've got there. Thank you so much, Professor Rifkin. A pleasure, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks.